Hello Santa Fe and welcome to Living Santa Fe today with Bonita Bonnie Ellis, the daughter-in-law of the famed artist Fremont Ellis. Uh -huh. And Bonnie, thank you for showing up today and thank you for bringing all these paintings that Fremont Ellis did. When did you come to Santa Fe? In May of 1947. And what were you doing over here? You came from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? Right. Yes, I uh, came down with my girlfriend, her, whose sister was going to UCLA, but got a summer job at La Fonda as a waitress during the summer. And she lived in the uh, basement uh, apartments. Uh, I guess they were dorms more. Anyway, she she got each of us a job to come down to Santa Fe to be uh, hostesses in the dining room, which we were. And I was, uh, I wasn't 21, so I couldn't work in the bar. So I, I worked in the main dining room and the New Mexican room. And uh, Edward Dean uh, worked in, in the bar and in various, the, various dining rooms, but uh, we were there the whole summer and it was just wonderful. And it was right after the war and everybody was celebrating. And that was the summer the horse came into the lobby with, with his rider. And that was world famous because they filmed it, I think. and. Uh, he walked right through. Anyway, he went into the bar, which was called the Snake Pit at that time. And it was as dark as this. And <laughs> and it was it was a really funny place. Anyway, but the bartender who was there, he was there for many, many years. And uh, and I think he didn't retire until maybe twenty five years ago. But uh, anyway, it was a great summer. And that's where I met my husband, Fred Ellis, Fremont's son, his only son. And he also had a daughter, Bambi, uh, who turned out to be a real beautiful gal. And she went to Hollywood. She, we had, Mr. Ellis had a sister who's husband was E.E. Uh, e. Clive from England, and he was a character actor in all of the um, Indian, uh, East Indian movies of the British Empire. And uh, anyway, she took uh, flamenco dancing from Rita Hayworth's father. And, but unfortunately in the year, I think she was out there two years, and she had a serious back injury, so she couldn't pro continue with it. And it was unfortunate because she was a beautiful dancer. And uh, anyway, but I met Fred, and he came across the lobby of the dining uh, towards the dining room, and he was had a, a wire-haired terrier on the leash, he was walking the dog. And I saw it and I, when I left Milwaukee, my parents had a wire-haired terrier. And of course, I was ecstatic <laughs> seeing the dog. Anyway, he stopped at the door to the dining room and spoke to Frank Griego, the maitre d'. And, uh, and so I was petting the dog and I didn't really see him. I just was wanting to talk to the dog, which was a sweetheart. Anyway, then I looked up, and there was Fred. And wham, that was it. I fell in love immediately. True love. My heart just <clears throat> boom. It really did. Well, you know, today's Valentine's Day. Yeah. So on behalf of Fred, your husband, I want to present 
present you with that. Oh, how sweet. A little rose. <laughs> how beautiful. And happy Valentine's Day, and that's a great oh. love story. Oh, yeah. He was a great guy. He had just been in the 8th Air Force. He served three years mm -hmm. during the war and in battle almost all the time. <clears throat> but he was exceptional. Oh, he was yeah. brilliant. I know he was. Uh -huh. I met him upon my return to Santa Fe from the University you of were New both Mexico. Harleen Bozio. Right. Yeah, and right. his dad worked in the highway. Absolutely. Your, fa your father. No, no, not my father. But, but uh, Fred and I worked together on the new Special. computer that they had just gotten in. Yeah, he was the one who convinced the state to buy the computers. That's right. And there were so many times when the computer would go off, they'd bring in Fred Ellis and Bobby Sullivan right. with their little black books, and they would do the payroll. Never missed a payroll, Yeah. even with the, with the computer. Yeah. So Fred, Fred was a very good friend of mine, and I thought the world of him. And yeah. I met you through Fred. That's right. Many years ago. Yeah. Okay, Bonnie, let's get into a little bit more of this story. Um, your name is Bonita. Right. And your nickname is Bonnie. Right. How did you do that now? Well, my f in Milwaukee, it was a melting pot for America. And my father's family came from Cologne, Germany. And my mother was from Vienna, Austria, and she was Viennese and Swiss and French. And uh, anyway, they came to the States. They're both their families mm -hmm. through the years. And uh, my mother's family had, was a large extended family, like all of the foreign people coming in. But they all ended up pretty much on the farms, which is where my mother was raised. Mm -hmm. But back in those days, young people worked. They, they just worked because there, was, there wasn't any money. You know, the farms didn't produce a great deal of produce. So the young people went out to work, and she had about a third grade education, but the nuns were marvelous teachers. And at that time, as I recall, <clears throat> my mother had to learn to speak English. And uh, if you didn't learn to speak English, I think it was in a year or two, you had a test. And if you didn't speak English properly, you, were, you, you or your family were sent back to Europe. And it was pretty tough. I know. And <clears throat> my father, his family, were apparently fairly well off. And uh, they had a um, furniture uh, design company and very skilled. And in those days, most of the furniture was handmade. There wasn't any manufacturing of furniture and uh, not in those days. Anyway, but they got to, to meet. Uh, he was going to Marquette University and my mother, and he met just quite casually, probably at a dance where they had, um, you know, just a small orchestra. It wasn't, you know, anything fancy, but young people always congregated. They always do that. But anyway, they met and married. And uh, there were seven of my, of my, I had three brothers and three sisters, all of them older than I. And of course, they're all gone now. And, uh, but uh, my, <coughs> my mother was very, intent on my, uh, all of us children being educated, as was my father. And we all were well educated. Then the war came. 
and that was World War II. And at the time, my older brother, Danny, was in the Philippines and in the tank corps. And my big brother, Mike, had been into, had been transferred into the Air Corps in the Pacific. He was in the Pacific during the war. And then my sister Nancy joined up as a WAC, and she spent the war years in England and in France. She went through the whole, um, actually she was the first military woman to land on, on um, D-Day, not D-Day, D plus 12, I think it was. But she was the first woman, military woman, to land on the, on France. And so she, <laughs> she was no bigger than a minute. And uh, she went on into the campaign into uh, Paris, to the freeing of Paris. And uh, anyway, but my brother Dan was captured in the Philippines after the Bataan uh, battle and went through uh, the terrible death march. How he survived, I don't know, but he did. And ended up in Japan for three years as a prisoner, which was pretty grim. And uh, but that was my family. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The Bataan Death March affected many, many people here in this oh, town. Oh, yes. In fact, at the highway department at that time, mm -hmm. there were many, many men in there that were survivors of the uh, POW camps. Oh, and yeah. And they never talked about it, so no. I would find out quite by accident about all these stories that they told, and, mm -hmm. and it was very interesting. One of the best shows we've ever done here was on one of the POWs from oh. uh, the Bataan Death March. Oh, yeah. So that was good. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Fremont. Okay. Now, Fremont has become worldwide famous. I mean, everybody knows Fremont Ellis or her, has heard about him, and there are <laughs> many, many art exhibits going. Uh, he was born October the 2nd, 1897. Right. That's a long time ago. In Virginia City, Montana. And the roughest, one of the roughest towns in the country was Virginia City. Gold mining was no, going on. No, silver mine. Or was it silver? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, his parents were Eleanor and Frederick Ellis, correct? Mm -hmm. She uh, was a Smurthwaite. She was from Manchester, England, and a Mormon. That's right, and mm -hmm. she she made hats. That's right. She was a milliner. I'll be darned. Uh, when they lived in, in that rough country over there, uh, they turned in kind of uh, wanderers, didn't they? The family, uh, the father was a dentist. Yes, actually he, in those days, there weren't really dentists except in the big cities. I mean, they called themselves dentists. But more than anything, they were kind of a medical doctor. And, uh, and he, he was doing his dental work, but then he got to be the uh, assayer for the mine. And so he got a job, but they lived out in a log cabin and uh, which is, was in a, Mr. Ellis was born in this big blizzard, but they were able to get to town on their sled. And uh, he was born in the tavern. Well, it wasn't a tavern. It was just a drinking place. A saloon. A saloon. <laughs> and it was actually the place where they hung the, the desperados who caused trouble. That was uh, out in the front. They had a um, bar that went out. In fact, I think in Virginia City, we went up to visit a couple of times, but they had a bar coming out across 
out of the front door, and that's where they hung the desperados when they, and then of course, Mr. Ellis would have to embalm him or do whatever he was doing and bury him. But strangely enough, Mr. Ellis did a, a cross, Virginia City goes right through a little canyon. And one side is housing, you know, the town itself pretty much. And the other side is this mountains. And they had the, the cemetery there. And in 19, I think it was 1970 some, he went up there and he did a painting of the, of the uh, village. He did. With the cemetery. And it's a beautiful painting. It's really sweet. And, and it showed the town. But that's what he did that day when he was up there visiting. Right. He went up on his 75th birthday, I think it was. And, uh, but it, it was a <laughs> kind of a charming thing to do. When, when uh, Fremont was born, where, where did he get the name Fremont? General Fremont. Okay, and General was Fremont was a soldier, but he was an explorer. Oh yeah, of of the land. Yes, yeah. He wasn't so much a a military man as he was an explorer. And he actually came, actually came through Santa Fe at one time mm -hmm. after his service up there in the in the Northwest. So that's <clears throat> where Fremont Ellis got his name was from yeah. General Fremont. Yeah, uh, the family. It, I mean, I read about the family. They were kind of interesting people. They were wanderers. They were nomadic. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Ellis, Fremont, did not have much of an education in schools, but he had a heck of an education with his parents. He did. His mother and his stepsister, Nellie, uh, she was a late teenager, I guess around 18 or 19 when he was born. And uh, she was the daughter of Mr. Ellis because Mr. Ellis' father and Mrs. Ellis was a Smurthwaite. They were both widowed and they had adult children when they married. And Fremont was the only issue of their marriage. I see. And so he had <clears throat> brothers and sisters on his dad's side and the same thing on his mother's side. And uh, his father's family, I think, settled in, were in Indiana. And then they started moving west. Right. And, uh, but that's how they met. I think they met in in Hamilton, Montana, and uh, <clears throat> and now, she had a milliner shop. Right. Yeah. Now, th their nomadic life brought them to state fairs, county fairs, uh, circuses, and they had a horse that they trained. And Don, they, yeah, Don Filano. Don Filano. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Don Filano performed. Yeah. And they made money off of that horse. Oh yeah, he, they built, <laughs> they had this collapsible uh, tub. Well, it wasn't a tub, it was a small swimming pool. And had this ramp that went up to the top and the horse would dive into the water and then he'd come out on the ramp. But he was a trick horse. He could do all kinds of funny things on stage. He was on stage, the horse was. And in those days, it was vaudeville. And uh, anyway, <laughs> he could count and he could pick up things from this de you know, the, the floor. And, and he, he could paw, he could dance in this. And it was a wonderful, and it was, that was, entertainment in those days. Sure. Sure. 
And uh, Mr. Ellis, as a kid, <clears throat> along with his, sis his stepsister and Nellie, she played the piano, and then he played the sound effects. And he would do the horses clapping, and he had the drum, and made the, the uh, tin crack for uh, lightning and thunder. Mm -hmm. and, and he did all those things. And in many cases, if the uh, act didn't show up on time, the train didn't get to the town or didn't have a horse and wagon. Anyway, he'd get up on the, dan on the stage and dance as a kid. And Nellie would play the piano. <laughs> and so it was, they were a um, team. Yeah. And but but that was a common thing in those days, actually. Sure. And because of this, Fremont was around adults a lot. Mm -hmm. So he, he learned so much from people that he was around in this nomadic existence that they mm -hmm. had. Yeah. And it, how did he begin to realize, I mean, did he paint all his life? Or did he always love the beauty of nature? I mean, it sounds to me like anything he saw, uh, he would paint that and, attracted him to it. Well, he, he saw beauty in everything. And, and it was a remarkable thing. When they were in New York City, that's another story. Uh, he, um, his mother said, I want to go to the um, Metropolitan Museum so you can take me, but your father is away on business, so you can take, we can go with, with their, their uh, carriage. And they had two horses. And in those days, kids used to take care of the horses and ride them and feed them and take care of them. That was a, 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 an essential thing. And uh, so he didn't want to do it, but she made him dress up and they went off to the museum. And uh, imagine in New York City, as a child doing something like that. I think he was, I think about 12. And so <laughs> when they got to the museum, they went into the rotunda, and here was this painting, this huge painting of mountains. And it was a Bierstadt, and he was a, a German man who came to the States, and he painted the West during his time. But this painting was probably 15 or 20 feet and probably 12 to 15 feet deep and was a magnificent painting. And he walked into it and he looked, he couldn't stop but looking at it. And he saw the light over the mountains and the sunlight and the shadows. And he couldn't figure out how that painter could get that light into that canvas. And he studied it and studied it. Well, then it ended up that he got this idea to um, copy the painting a 12-year-old boy, and he went to that museum on his own every day as often as he could. And he would do this with his eye. And he'd study the painting in one spot and photograph that into his mind. And then he'd go home <clears throat> and he got paper from the corner butcher store. And he would paint that onto his paper, that particular part of the painting. He ended up doing that entire painting. And it took him something like a year 
to do that on butcher paper. And I don't know what happened to the painting, but he finally figured out what it was that Bierstadt did to get that sunlight over the mountains. And it was an incredible story. So it was a visual and mental acuity that he had to and He out. taught himself to be, have a photographic <clears throat> memory. He could paint a painting of a scene that he saw as a child <clears throat> when he was 70 year, years old. And he could remember that scene. And that painting that you have here of the plaza yes, we'll is one of those. That because the original painting somehow got destroyed and damaged, oh, in the flood of the Rio Grande in Española ah. on their honeymoon. Anyway, in 1972, he painted that scene. After that many years, he remembered it. Uh -huh. Interesting. That particular painting of the plaza. Well, you know, while he was wandering around over there as a kid yeah. in the Met and uh, all these art galleries, he met Charles Russell. Yeah. The famous artist. Yeah. And he got some. I bet he. How did he get to know him? Did he just go up and start talking? No, he just. He he go in those days, and I don't know if the museums was allow it anymore. But artists or people who wanted to be an artist would go to the museums and they'd bring their equipment and they'd sit and they'd paint, they'd make copies of what they saw. Because there really weren't any art uh, teachers, right. per se. <clears throat> but although he did, his father wanted him to have some kind of a career. He, as an artist, he said, you're not going to make it, Fremont. So you really need to have a, uh, some kind of skill. And so he insisted, first of all, he went to a secretarial school, which he actually didn't really work for him. <laughs> and then he went in while in New York went to uh, art school, and it was connected somehow to the Metropolitan. And, uh, but the artist was the, the teacher who was a, an artist, kind of restricted the students, and he didn't like that. He liked the idea of being able to paint what he saw and how he saw it. And so he said that he learned more from the students than he ever did from the teacher. And he, after that, he never went to an art school again. That's right. Yeah. At 16, now he wasn't much into portraits, but he painted his mother. That was a, I've, I've seen it. I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. That was pretty impressive. But he didn't really like portraits. I, no. I, I gathered he liked mostly yeah. sunsets and moons and yeah yeah, hmm. yeah he liked nature he uh, he did many portraits now he took an optometry course what a month optometry course or Down something down in like El Paso that. and then he took a course in painting at that time um, and that's when he got his first break of exhibiting in a, in a university in El Paso. He started right. exhibiting his paintings. And that, he was just a kid. Then, 1918, he travels to Santa Fe, New Mexico. That must have been a real eye-opener for him. Yeah, he, that was when the train used to go to the station where the rail yard is. Yes. Yeah. And, and he saw these beautiful landscapes, because New Mexico is beautiful. It's very different from other states. But it's the light. The he light. always said it was the light. Okay. Now, we will show a picture of this later. 
this will appear in the thing. But I have a picture here of the Santa Fe Plaza, and it shows the obelisk instead of the box, which we have today. I don't think Fremont Ellis would like that box to be out there. No. He's painted the obelisk, and he has a number of people in the painting, and we will show this painting. And there's a lady walking through the middle of it. There's a dog, there's a mother and a, a child and a man, and there's a lone woman with a pink, very bright pink hat on. Who was that woman? No, that's Laurencita Gonzalez y Romero. Who and lived? she was from Agua Fria. She lived on Agua Fria, and she worked in the in where Zooks is. Zooks, yeah. At that time, at the at the soda fountain, and that's where he met her. And he fell in love with her. That's right, and they married in nineteen. I think it was twenty or twenty-one, somewhere around there, because he was it, right after. They got here. He met her evidently fairly quick, and and they got married by a justice of the peace. And I'm sure her parents uh, did not like that, so they did get it sanctified by the, at the Catholic, cathedral. yeah, uh, cathedral. The cathedral, right? <laughs> okay. Then the next person in his life that I didn't know about was Harper Henry who was an entrepreneur, he knew how to do engineering, he knew design, uh, he had many talents. And Fremont met up with him. Right, in California. <laughs> in 1921, he came back to Santa Fe. And how did that all happen? What happened in 1921 that made him come back? Well, uh, Harper Henry was, as you say, an entrepreneur, and he decided to come back to Santa Fe, so he built what I think was the first trailer, and he had this rinky-dink old truck, and he built uh, bunks into it, I think there were four or six bunks, but there was all open to the, you know, there weren't any shades or windows or anything. And they called it the, not Noah's Ark, uh, Ark of the Desert, Ark of the Desert. <laughs> and they traveled across the Ark of the Desert, they actually did all through the Navajo country, and the paying customers were artists, and they paid their way, and that was where they got the gasoline from when they got, when they were able to get gasoline. But they took, I think it took three months for them to come across. What a great trip that was. Yeah. And then they got to the Grand Canyon of all things, going into the Grand Canyon, which was, I'm sure, just a mud road. There was, you know, nothing, no, nothing real fancy. <clears throat> and uh, Mr. Ellis was able to sell, I don't know if, if he was, one or two paintings in the town outside of, uh, well, I guess, Flagstaff. And so they went to the Grand Canyon, and to, to celebrate, they had hotel rooms. And so they had their first real meal at the hotel. And <laughs> Mr. Ellis never forgave lunch. He bought this fancy meal, and because she hadn't been able, you know, you were. They were eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and that kind of thing. They didn't have any real food. And so, unfortunately, she upchucked it 
And so he was so mad at her because he had to spend all that money on that food and she didn't eat. <laughs> <laughs> she was eating healthy food. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, in 1921, another phase of his life here in Santa Fe, the beginning of the Cinco Pintores, mm -hmm. the five painters. There was Joseph Bacos, Will Schuster, uh, Fremont, Merck, Merck, and oh shoot, uh, Walsh. 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 Yeah. yeah. Now those five guys got together, and they were all painters, and they ended up on the Camino del Sol, which was actually back then. Telegraph Hill. Telegraph Hill, that's, that's right. That's where the telegraph went on to Las Vegas. And uh, it was Mr. Applegate, who was an artist himself. And he had, he had some money, but he told the five artists that he'd get, bankroll them for $500 each if they would build houses on the Camino on Telegraph Hill. And back then there was nothing in that ter area except some small little uh, farms. And <clears throat> he uh, bankrolled them and they built, they started to build their adobe houses, which they had never None of them had ever built a house, much less adobe. And there were some wonderful stories about them, how they, they would pile the adobes one on top of the other, which you don't do even with bricks. You have to alternate them. And so I think it was Will Schuster, or I can't remember if it was Fremont. <clears throat> They had their, got their wall up and they were so, so they were going to celebrate. They had about five feet of wall up. And lo and behold, they fell down because they, they weren't anchored. <laughs> and, and so anyway, but they learned the hard way. And it was wonderful that the Spanish accepted them. Yeah, these Anglos coming into yeah. Santa Fe, New Mexico, that yeah. was quite a yeah. quite a deal. They call them hmm? the five nuts. nuts. It was in the mud huts. In the mud huts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they did the our, the Spanish um, were very kind to them. They accepted them in those days. It was a an acceptance kind of thing. And they would uh, help them out. The fellas, would, the fellas would go over and help them. And it was actually the Spanish men from the village, from around town, who would help them you know, how, how to do this building, you know. And, um, and in in many cases, initially they would call them the Innocentes because <laughs> they were so, they were city people and they didn't know how to survive. But they learned pretty quick. <laughs> That's actually when, when the art, artist row up Canyon Road started, started. with, with the right. Cinco Pintores. Yeah. Uh, at that time, there was, they made two very successful, well, Fremont made two very successful sales. One was When Evening Comes, which was the painting that was at the old De Vargas Hotel, which mm. is now the St. Francis. And then uh, the other one was bought by Frank Springer, mm -hmm. who was an entrepreneur from Springer, New Mexico. He's a big rancher, big, right? Big rancher, very wealthy, and the name of that 
well, that is that is shown in Los Angeles was the gathering storm. Mm -hmm. And that was a beautiful painting. I remember the one at the DeBargas. Yeah. At I don't know what happened to the other one. The gathering storm, it's I would guess it's probably still in LA, but I'm not positive of yeah. it. That's just what I've researched. Yeah. Well, that was amazing. But then the exposition uh, was had not long after that, and that's when Hewlett got into the picture, who was the first director of the museum. He actually built the museum. The Fine Arts Museum. Yes. Hewlett? Hewlett. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, now come the Prohibition years. Now this is when Santa Fe starts. This is a time I would have loved to have been in Santa Fe. <laughs> We really, uh, really had bathtub, bathtub gin. <laughs> well, they made their own beer. <laughs> they made their own own whiskey. Yeah, uh, that's right. The Cinco Pintores, and they must have had a heck of a good time here. Yeah. Well, one but one interesting thing about that is Mr. Ellis was a teetotaler. <laughs> His mother was killed by a drunk driver in L.A. Ah. And he never drank. And uh, of course, Schuess was great at that, and Bacos. <laughs> but but they were all happy, you know. You know they're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary this year of Schuster and the Zozobra. Oh right! Do you remember that? Well, I remember I remember the, my I husband you, telling me the story. Yeah. Of the Zozobra, he and Bambi. They were pretty, you know, toddlers. But he said he remembered that um, Schuess made the first Zuzobra, which was just a, a paper mache kind of thing, uh, figure. And uh, they burnt it in the backyard, you know, that was their celebration. And Schuess loved fireworks. And Mrs. Ellis made the kids go and stay in the house because she didn't want them to get hit with the fireworks. And uh, anyway, they, they were able to look out the window. But he said that was one of Schuess's, he, he had man, he had a cannon and he used to shoot stuff up. <laughs> and he made, he actually, a lot of, I think he even made a lot of his own fireworks. Oh, I'm sure he did. Yeah. They were hell raisers. Yeah. Um, Mr. Bacos, Joseph Bacos, taught at Santa Fe High School when right. I was there. He was an art teacher. Yeah. Duh, I didn't take art. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. Yeah, yeah. really. Well, you know, his wife, Teresa, she was married uh, to a, a very high prominent a diplomat in Washington, D.C., and uh, she was schooled in Europe, and she was a great artist of miniatures, Teresa Bacos. Mm -hmm. and she I was, heard that. And she was a beautiful woman, and she had two sons by her first marriage, one of which eventually came back to Santa Fe as a young adult and lived all his life here, the young yes. one, the younger well, he boy. He was a very handsome man, I think. Oh, yeah, and Bacos. I remember him. They were, they were a wonderful couple, and so. Okay, 1930s, it started picking up a little bit for the Ellis family. Um, they traded six paintings for some land, the San Sebastian land grant. Mm -hmm. That's where their that's where the ranch was built. Right. They start building in 1939. Uh, 29. Yeah, 29. That's right. It would have been 1929, and they got their stuff from a uh, uh, Galisteo. Yeah. Well, initially. They lived in a tent, I think, for two or three years. He got an old World War I tent, 
and they rented their house on the Camino. And um, they decided, Mr. and Mrs. Ellis decided, well, they could make money in the summer living in the tent. And then for the summer fo people who would come to visit, they'd rent the house, which is what they did. And th that's how they made some money. And uh, that, the first part of the house was built on site. Okay. And then the idea came up to Mr. Ellis when they were out at, on Sundays. They generally went for uh, painting. Mr. Ellis would paint outside. And so they, he liked to go to Galisteo. And he was walking through the village and he got to thinking about there were a number of houses that were vacant. And he thought, why can't I get those, buy those buildings and then transfer all of that stuff up to the ranch? And then I won't have to have build, you know, make, make the um, adobes. So he got this brilliant idea and he was probably one of the original recyclers in Santa Fe because he bought, initially he bought, I think, three buildings, one of which was the Pino house. Yeah, Don Bat Batista yeah, Pino. Right. And <clears throat> so anyway, he would get a crew of men from Canyon de Cito, uh, Can Canyon, Cassie, what is it? Um, Calisdale, sometimes Lamy. Um, what is the one on them? Oh dear, I can't think of it. The village, the old, ancient village was started with the Basque sheep herders. Uh, Cañada de los Alamos. There you go. And uh, he'd get them together on a Saturday morning early and they'd bring their beans and chili and tortillas and he rented the uh, flatbed truck and he'd go to Ellis Bowers filling station on Friday. He'd get two five gallon crankcase oil to get the bill, get the truck down to Gallisdale and the next second five gallon tank to get it back home, back to the ranch. And they would reassemble, take everything down off of the truck and put it down on the ground. And they did this over a period of seven or eight months and assembled all of the adobes, <clears throat> the windows, the frames, the flooring, the entire patio. And then he redesigned everything and built the ranch from that. That took 17 years. Yeah. And then Henry Harper came back into the picture and supervised that. That's right. Harper was the one who set it up and got him to do the uh, base, you know, for the adobes and everything. And it was a tremendous thing. It, it really was. And it was uh, this architect who was then uh, one of the um, sponsors for, for a grant down in the University of New Mexico came up and visited with him, and he was amazed how he had assembled everything, reassembled everything. And three of the rooms in, the, in that part of the house were actually the same size as they were down in Galisteo I'll be darned. in the Pino house. <clears throat> and the, the ranch, if you go out off on 
uh, uh, Opecos Trail, go out to where the now the FINA station is, it's back up in there. Yeah. And that is where the house was. Yeah, and, that, and you lived there. Oh, well, I lived there 77 years. Yes. And our children were raised there. How many children do you have? Uh, three boys. Uh, two of who, Fremont and Fred, are here in Santa Fe, and my youngest is in Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where they were raised. And of course, Bambi. Bambi too. And Bambi and Fred were raised there. Yeah. And so they actually moved into the house around 1940s. Uh huh. The art market started booming for Fremont then. Yeah. He, that was uh, very productive for his paintings at oh, that yeah. time. Um, then there was the USS Steamship that was built and took his paintings and put them in this, this I guess it was a luxury ship? Oh yes, it was, a, it was in competition with the Queen's. The Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. And that, that ship brought over 300,000 military personnel from the United States to Europe and back yeah. to the United States and never got hit. No. And it never actually, it, it was reassembled after the war. And it, it did start out again as a luxury ship to Hawaii. And, uh, but then there was so much competition with the air, airlines and that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's and right. so, uh -huh. yeah. So, so that painting was later taken up by the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, and placed in their Chicago office. Oh yeah. I'll be darned. It's very fascinating. This whole story. Then you traveled back to Montana toward the end of Fremont's life. And he had a, that's when he paid his visit there. Yeah, he, he, he. Did you go with him? No, not that trip. We went on the, the following, I think we went the following month. But uh, it, it, he had a tremendous life. And he was um, one of the last Western men who was a very honorable man, and his handshake was his word. And uh, it was a, he was a very interesting person. He would have been a great politician. He would have, <laughs> but he, 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 but he, but it was very strange when he was, had, um, gotten so many awards, like uh, in Oklahoma, the um, uh, Cowboy Award of, 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 the, of Oklahoma, and that was the name of the exhibition. But he got, I think he got that three times. He got the uh, Los Angeles County Museum Award, the, what is the famous, museum there built by the man <clears throat> and his wife who actually built Stanford. Um, anyway, he had awards from museums from all over and, uh, and it was very interesting that how he, his word spread. And actually, he actually sold his own paintings he would, he would take a carload of paintings down to Texas as a young man, and he would just travel the country, and he'd stay where he could, and if he had a few dollars, he would maybe stay in a hotel, if there was a hotel. But he said that the people of Texas were all was very, very interested in his paintings. The women of Texas, actually, they made up tea parties where he would show paintings out in the middle of nowhere. They'd get together, the women. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and it it was a wonderful way of uh, doing business. Doing business, yeah. yeah. Traveling, traveling yeah. the country. Yeah, he actually did his own sales. He was a good good salesman. Mm -hmm. And on January the twelfth, nineteen eighty-five, he passed. What did he die of? Actually, he he had had a, a fender bender that he, he wasn't responsible for, and uh, he had hit his head on the steering wheel, as I recall. Anyway, it within a few weeks he. Well, there was more to that story, but I, you can read about it in the New Mexican. Okay. It was very tragic. Yeah. But he just went to sleep. But up until that time, up until a month or so before, he, would, he was still painting. He painted from the time he was 12 years old till he was 87. And he and his, his wife, Lorencita, are buried at Rosario Cemetery. What a proper place for both of them. Yes, right next to each other. Did they have big funerals? <gasps> his funeral was huge at the cathedral. And it was very strange because he was born and raised a Mormon. And because uh, his parents, his grandparents <clears throat> were in Salt Lake City, and that's where his mother, his grandparents, were in Lost Salt Lake City. And his his mother, as a widow, came to the States, and that was when the Mormons were being uh, persecuted in England, and uh, they escaped to uh, Belgium, I think, Belgium and Netherlands, and, uh, but that's where his mother came from, to the States. And, uh, and he fought, fought, in fact, we have her prayer book, but uh, she, Mr. Ellis had such a love for the Catholic faith and for the beauty and the, and the color and the celebration of the church and he loved churches and he painted I think every church in Marada in San, in New Mexico at one time or another and wherever he went he'd paint a church even when in old Mexico sure yeah yeah he there were a lot of his paintings <laughs> who was at his funeral give me some ideas do you remember brother Cyprian Luke who is the president of the College of Santa Fe gave his exquisite eulogy. It was absolutely stunning. And uh, the governor, the mayor, oh, there were people that came from all over for the funeral. And the church was filled to capacity. They were only standing room only. And the artists came and it was what was the Italian fella, Batiste, who paint, painted, painted outside mostly, um, and he he was standing at the back of the church when we were taking the casket out, and he was crying, and he loved Fremont because they were good friends, mm -hmm. and Fremont would stop and talk to him and visit with him while he was painting. It was a, uh, I saw it more than once in t when I was driving in town. So he got a great send off. Oh, yeah. Bonnie, how do you remember all these things? You have a fantastic memory. You look fantastic. Oh, thank you. Do you mind telling us your age? Well, I'm 98 and a half or a little more. <laughs> I'll be 99 in June. Congratulations. Oh, thank you.
I hope you have many more years. Well, thank you. I hope they're as peaceful as they are right now. But my life is changing. And you have to learn to accept the change. Now, something you told me about yourself that I didn't know. You worked at the Pentagon. What in the world were you doing over at the Pentagon? Well, my sister Pat got this brilliant idea. She was 10 years older than I. And she was a super executive secretary at the time. And we, during the war, she, we felt so helpless not being able to help. So we got this bright idea to go to Washington to work because she had heard about that they were recruiting uh, people to go to work in the Pentagon, which had just opened. It was a brand new structure. And so anyway, she said, well, let's, let's go and check it out. And of course, my parents <laughs> were stunned that this is what we were going to do. But we uh, had to work for the FBI, I think, one or two months. And I just graduated from high school. And uh, so I was working uh, at the FBI with her. And uh, all we did at that time was type up uh, the histories of people they were interviewing. And, uh, and then we were able to go to Washington, and we were fortunately assigned to the general staff in the Pentagon, which is top echelon of the Defense Department. And I got to the Pentagon, and two gals from Milwaukee who only went up to the eighth floor in the city hall in an elevator here, we were going up and uh, up and down on escalators. <laughs> we didn't. We, it took us forever to find where we were supposed to go in the Pentagon. But it had a tremendous background, and uh, all of the officers that we worked for were either uh, graduates of, of West Point or the War College. And many of them were actually from the field. They had already been in battle. And uh, so they were assigned, because many of them were brought back with injuries. And uh, so they, but they were senior staff officers. And, uh, and one Easter Sunday, in 1944, I think it was. I was working for the executive officer, and uh, on the fourth floor, and this military contingent came to the door, and they were the enlisted men were fully garbed with guns and and the whole shebang and so i said well is there something i can help you with and he, and the senior officer who was a colonel said i need to speak to general maxwell and i said oh fine do you have an appointment no and i said well why don't you wait <clears throat> and we had security officers all over the pentagon of course but that was the first time I saw them fully garbed with all their equipment. And uh, so they had a conference in, in his inner office. And then the general came out and he said, well, uh, Miss Byer, he said, you're going to follow, go with these gentlemen uh, to take the minutes of a special meeting up in the uh, conference on the fifth floor. And uh, so they took my typewriter and all my gear and whatever it was I needed to take dictation. And up in the 
fifth, on the fifth floor was this huge uh, auditorium and uh, where I had, had been to Mass earlier in the morning on Sunday. And so I couldn't believe it. There were all these men in this. And they were all in their dress gear. And it was an assembly of the uh, theater directors, commanders from the five uh, divisions. And they were from England, France, uh, Italy, uh, CBI, that, that's uh, China, India, Burma, which was the oldest. And uh, anyway, it was the assembly for the briefing of D-Day. Mm -hmm. And I and a, a young whack, uh, she was a military uh, enlisted woman, were given the task of taking the dictation of this assembly of which there were probably 200, 250 maybe men. And came, they were from all over the world. And they had come for this to discuss D-Day and get the instructions. General Marshall was there. Uh, actually, Montgomery was there from England. Uh, and uh, oh, uh, Stillwell, they were all the great, great commanders. And so I was on one side of the stage, and this whack was on the other side of the stage with our equipment. And General Marshall conducted the session and had a screen up and was explaining what was going to happen. And uh, anyway, I took all the dictation. And interestingly enough, the only woman in that assembly was Oveta Culp Hobby of Dallas. And she was the woman in charge of the WAC, the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. And, uh, but she was the only other woman. We were three women with this assembly. And we, and of course, we had pages and pages and pages of dictation. Then when this was all done, we had to go to a special room where we transcribed everything. Well, by that time, it was 6 o'clock in the evening. And I hadn't had any lunch. I mean, we just worked, worked, worked. And so we had to transcribe everything. And we, we did that, the two of us. She was in a different room and I was in a different room with these military men sitting there with their guns and, and, and equipment waiting for us. And uh, so anyway, we finished around, I think it was close to midnight. And uh, I hadn't yet been home. And at the time, my sister and I, with three other girls, had rented a house in West Over Hills, which was 10 miles out of town. And the last bus left Washington at 9 o'clock in the evening. So I had no way of getting home. There were no cabs in those days and no bus service. And so I said, well, I got to go home, but how, how am I going to go home? And they said, well, I guess we'll have to take you. So they took me in this military unit home. And my sister was there, and she called the police because she didn't know where I was, 
because I was incommunicado. And, and so this would, like I say, was around midnight, and she said, where have you been? And I said, I was working. She said, well, why didn't you call me on this? I said, well, I couldn't. And she, she told these, uh, these military, the two military men, why didn't you let her call? And they didn't say anything, you know. <laughs> they were just driving me home. <laughs> and it was a pretty funny scene. But I was sworn to secrecy for 15 years. And I never told anyone about that. It was, I think, 40 years before I told Fred, my husband. And I kept that secret all that time, but I put it back here. But I can remember and I can see those people and see that assembly. And then when D-Day came, I thought, my God, I had something to do with that. Isn't that strange? It's pretty impressive. And I was 19 years old. <clears throat> you know, by helping with that war effort that stopped fascism in the world. It sure did. It's starting up again. It's horrible. I wish you would get me into something like that. <laughs> I would volunteer. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. That's great, Bonnie. But we worked during the war just like <clears throat> everybody. You work seven days a week. Maybe you got a, a day off every two or three weeks, a day, maybe. But everybody did, Easy, even Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> you probably heard about oh, her. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I know several women that were Rosie the Riveters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Bonnie, this has been one of the most interesting stories I've heard in a long time. Hmm. And I can't thank you enough for being here today. <laughs> and um, I have read this book, which was written by Barbara, Barbara Spencer Foster and Bambi Elizabeth Ellis, dedicated to the Ellis family. So today I'm dedicating this show to you and your all to Fred, Bambi, all your children. No, oh, how nice. That's thank beautiful. You. And thank you. And in the public, anybody that wants this book can go to www.sunstonepress.com. Wonderful. Bonnie, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you it's so a, much. It's been a pleasure. It's this been is a wonderful. This is a first for you. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a wonderful occasion. Thank you, Santa Fe, for watching. <laughs>